I am uh, delighted uh, to be here. And the topic we have is complicated, but since you have been hearing about origins uh, for a semester or longer now, you are well positioned to both take in anything I throw at you and to ask questions about it. Um, and it's obvious to everyone in the room that cancer is a problem, either for you individually, for a family member, for a friend, uh, and that progress is being made, but slowly. And my task tonight is explain why in the world cancer has to exist uh, given the evolution of our species. So the real questions that we're going to attempt to address over the next two weeks, not all today, are what are the causes of cancer? I'll try to help you become experts at that. Uh, but the basic premise for these lectures is that it really is related to evolutionary processes. So um, what is it that's cancer? Well, it's the abnormal uh, result of uh, normal cell functions that go haywire in some manner that allows them to exceed the boundaries of normal cells. Um, the origins of these processes really do go back all the way to the single cell organisms, as we will uh, discuss. Um, and as I will spend some time on in our second talk, uh, Darwinian evolution is, in fact, a major activity and causative for many things that we see within a single person and a single person's cancer. So um, uh, if we address this question and can answer it, we'll be far along. Um, if evolution created cancer, uh, can we understand uh, evolution and use it to our advantage to now block those processes and maybe even cure cancer, or, or at least delay its uh, impact. So um, the things that bind all the cancers that one can get together are what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm not going to talk specifically about any particular type of cancer, colon cancer, thymoma, leukemia. But they all have the same fundamental processes going on despite where they occur and how rapidly uh, they grow. Uh, a key premise is that cells divide too much, forget to die, uh, and that they spread in a manner that's inconsistent with the rest of the uh, organism. Uh, there are benign tumors. Uh, you all have them, whether they be little papules on your skin, um, uh, polyps in your throat, or your nose. So benign tumors occur. Uh, they can be problematic. Uh, a meningioma of the brain is a benign tumor, but if it's in the wrong location, it could be uh, devastating. Um, so just as a simple guess, there's probably over 200 types uh, of cancer, really defined by the fact that we have many, many different organs and parts of organs that we can ascribe a term to. Uh, and as I'll point out, it's even more complicated than that. <laughs> so although I'm going to suggest that it was the bacteria that gave us the concept and the forerunners of cancer. We certainly have known about cancer for close to 4,000 years. It's in the earliest writings. It was recognized then that there was a no cure. Uh, I don't think any cancer process has evolved from that short 4,000 year ago, which is not long in evolution. Uh, we began to treat. Uh, uh, cancer by surgery um, as early as uh, 25 BC uh, and under the crude capabilities that we had of surgery back in the uh, 17th century, um, we were removing tumors uh, completely uh, even without the use of antibiotics. So our understanding and management of uh, cancer has remained fairly stagnant. I had a patient uh, um, with a uh, myeloma I cared for for about 15 years, who was a professor of anthropology at uh, Kent State. He brought me in a book that he'd written showing me tons of holes in the bones of Native uh, Americans in southern Ohio that he'd been studying for decades uh, as an indication that he had uncovered uh, now three, four, five thousand uh, years ago. Uh, uh, indications of the same disease that he was suffering from uh, just a few years back. Every scientific advance in biology 
has used cancer as a main focus of what they wanted to study because of its importance at the time and because of the mysteries uh, that it um, uh, evolved. And so uh, use of the microscope has ha allowed us to understand uh, at the cellular level uh, what was going on. Um, the genetic basis was hinted at um, well before we understood what uh, DNA was. Um, and uh, epidemiology uh, was important in the early uh, 20th century. And the best uh, epidemiology of the time was the uh, presence of um, GU cancers in chimney sweeps um, before uh, smoking uh, became another uh, large epidemiologic recognition around uh, cancer. So <clears throat> what I'm going to suggest to you is that our basic understandings of what were thought of as biologic processes, but which you all know of as evolutionary processes, have been critical to how we go, around, go about understanding the approach um, uh, to cancer and further appreciation of uh, what it is. Now, there's a local flavor to this. <laughs> so some of the aspects I'm going to cover uh, include uh, issues related to hormones. Um, in the, early, in the early 1970s, uh, Earl Sutherland won a Nobel Prize, his pictures outside, uh, on the mechanism of action of hormones. And in fact, tamoxifen, an anti-hormone, was uh, developed here at university hospitals as a treatment in the early 70s uh, for uh, breast cancer. Uh, Harlan Wood was key to our understanding of second messengers. Here's uh, uh, the molecule cyclic AMP, which was a critical second messenger that allowed um, molecules, parts of the cell to talk to each other, allowed cells to talk to each other, um, to bring forward the pathways that the key uh, regulatory uh, molecules in each cell that would control what a cell did uh, would take place. This was started out in bacteria and then uh, recognized to be really important uh, for every single eukaryotic uh, cell uh, process. Um, and so we began at that time to also realize that's, that organisms were made up of organelles. Organelles were made up of, of um, sets of cells of similar types and, and, and uh, um, um, complementary types, which were frankly no more complicated than uh, the social activities of amoeba or any other single cell organism uh, that you could imagine with symbiotic relationships, processes happening inside and between cells, all through signaling in part from cyclic AMP and related uh, molecules. Now life got more complicated as we moved into the 1970s, 1980s and beyond. Here's an early uh, picture of, uh, of uh, Harold Varmus. Um, who was in town recently at uh, Oberlin to give a talk to the uh, undergraduates about uh, how to become a scientist. And uh, it was frankly quite remarkable to me to see the level of the questions that those undergraduates posed with him. And he started out his career uh, studying cyclic AMP. Um, and I realized at that time that he'd been an, an English major uh, at um, uh, a liberal arts, small liberal arts school. And then it took him a while to figure out that he actually wanted to be a scientist. And I've lost my picture here, but I can see it up here. And let's see if I do something here. There we go. Good. Um, and it was only a decade later that he had discovered what became, uh, and we commonly use in the cancer field now, of an oncogene. And I will explain what oncogenes are. But in essence, oncogenes are uh, normal onco normal cellular genes that produce proteins that are very important in telling a cell what to do. And a cell does a whole variety of things over the course of its life. Um, proliferates, talks to other cells, metabolizes, divides. And certain of these normal genes can be co-opted uh, into uh, abnormal uh, um, activities that allows the cell to grow uncontrollably and turns and transforms that cell into what becomes and what is recognized as a cancer cell. So a fundamental first concept for you for this evening is that every tumor, every cancer, has 
genes that are abnormally functioning, and the normal gene is somehow altered, we'll use the word mutation, somehow altered to now function and force that cell to become a cancer cell. It's not a new gene, not a different gene. It's just, in fact, a normal gene that's been co-opted. Now, we've learned more about that through a similar process um, that was helped along by David Baltimore. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I rode my bike uh, down the street to uh, MIT and took two classes with David Baltimore uh, in the uh, early 1970s on DNA tumor viruses. And he, the second year when I was a senior, I took a course on RNA tumor viruses. And at that time, it was a little bewildering, but all we knew was that if you uh, extracted a, a tumor cell and filtered away so there weren't any cellular material and just took the liquid that came out of the cell, you could transfer the cancer portion function of that cell to a new cell. And that became recognized as a function of a virus. And David was giving talks on DNA and RNA uh, tumor viruses. Now, what he did in his uh, research at that time in studying these viruses was to identify a critical function that was really revolutionary at the time. And that is an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Although I don't want to go through the details of it, in simple terms, every cell to divide has to take its DNA, make another copy, and divide it into two parts so every cell has the same amount of DNA. And what for a long time we didn't understand about RNA viruses was if it's an RNA, how does it get back to the DNA, since the dogma of the time was that DNA was in your chromosomes, and the chromosomes then allowed that DNA to be transferred into RNA, where it then made proteins. And we didn't know how to go from RNA back to DNA. So in those viruses, in those RNA viruses, was an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase could take that RNA in the virus and convert it back into DNA. And the DNA could then slip inside the cell's DNA. So now, for the first time, we had an, exa an, an example of an RNA virus that could bring in brand new DNA, brand new RNA, new genes, and have them be inserted for, for the life of that cell um, and its progeny into the DNA of that cell. So all of a sudden, we had a way, a carrier pigeon, if you will, for taking a normal gene, putting it in the wrong place in a cell, and having that cell become a tumor. So that was revolutionary at the time. This process occurred in the mid-70s. In 1982, we recognized the infection, which has been devastating to hundreds of thousands of individuals, called um, uh, uh, human immunodeficiency virus, or the AIDS virus, which is, in fact, an RNA virus, which requires the same enzyme reverse transcriptase and many of the treatments that we have are now, that are useful for uh, anti-HIV therapy, in fact, interrupt uh, this same process. I've been reading recently about male and female cells and how research and clinical trials have to be conducted differently. How does that factor into your research? Well, that's an exceptionally good uh, question. So uh, the question was, uh, uh, what about male and female cells, which in a simple way we can imagine being identical except for the XX versus XY chromosome. So in its simplest form, we could ask about the genes <clears throat> that are located on the X um, twice in a woman and only once in a male, and those on the Y chromosome that are never seen uh, in a woman. <clears throat> it's in fact much more complicated than that because the sets of genes that are expressed given the homeostatic environment of the male and the female are such that there are thousands of genes differentially expressed in males and females. And so the reason the issue comes up about testing 
uh, differently drugs and other interventions. It could be any intervention that you had in mind. It could be exercise uh, that are different between males and females is because of the number of genes that are expressed differently, the effects of hormones, et cetera. So they may be the same species, but they're quite different organisms. In describing the cancer cells, you said that sometimes they forget to die. Does that have any implications for life extension? Can we take a normal cell and let it for, forget to die? You hate it when somebody asks you a question that's, that's the middle of what you're discovering back in the laboratory. <laughs> um, so I use that because and I, uh, the next couple of slides will, in fact, come back to that topic. I really like that term because it wakes people up. Uh, you mean cells are supposed to die? Well, what's that about? And at the end of my talk, we're going to come back, and I'm going to want an answer for you, because an answer from you, so you can think about it when I show my last slide. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, no, no sweat. Um, so the best example of that is a condition called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia is the growth of a type of lymphocyte, a white cell circulating around your blood, that makes antibodies. <clears throat> and we've all had infections, and we've all had a swollen gland. And that gland is maybe 20 billion lymphocytes, all designed to go after that bacteria with a small set of antibodies directed towards that bacteria. You clear up the bacteria, what are you going to do with all those cells? We all know that gland disappears. What happened? Those cells died. Except for maybe 50 that hung around. And I've got to be careful, because I'm not an immunologist, and Neil Greenspan's in the audience. But let's just pretend I know what I'm talking about. So about 50 of those cells will remain as memory cells. So the next time you get that bacterial infection, you don't get a swollen gland because they're really smart cells and they'll go after that bacteria immediately. So there's a gene that turns them on and there's a gene that turns them off. So in CLL, the gene that turns them on is expressed much too greatly and the gene that turns them off isn't, isn't expressed enough. Those cells forget to die. And so what happens over the life of someone with chronic lymphocytic leukemia is they go from a white cell count, which is normal, of maybe 8,000 to 9,000, to a white cell count of 50,000, 200,000, maybe a million. And they get pounds of lymph nodes from pounds of those cells. The cells just forgot to die. I want to move into now a little more um, mechanistic approach to uh, the study of cancer in its parts. So we're going to go through this twice, first in English and then with some diagrams. Let's try the English part. <laughs> so first principle about cancer, all cancers have mutations. The mutations are in a variety of genes. And whatever those genes are, there's one or more mutation. In fact, we think most cancers have between 20 and 5,000 mutations in critical spaces in genes. <laughs> this allows those cells to grow abnormally in whatever that means. But they don't grow and don't follow the normal pattern and architecture of obeying the rules, if you will, um, of cell process. Now, the easiest way to think about that is to look at the mole on your skin. All of us have moles, most all of us. And that's an abnormal growth of cells, a benign growth, if you will, of pigmented cells. That's why we see them. And so you can imagine what happens if, if that goes further haywire. Now, almost no cancers have a single set of mutations, a switch on, that forms a cancer, and that's it. Every cancer has genetic changes that continue that encourage it to grow. Um, pretty obvious, but it needs to be said that if the cells died, you wouldn't have a problem. So they grow. And in fact, we know that there are situations where the preeminent process and problem of a cancer uh, is that it has a, an unstable genetic system. And most of the cells from that tumor keep dying. <laughs> 
and a few figure out how to not die. And those are the ones uh, that um, we, show, we see and show up. So it's the genetic changes that are encouraging that growth to take place. As I mentioned, cells forget to differentiate or to die, depending on the type of tumor. And they learn how to spread beyond their normal bounds. <laughs> We've all had a wound, scratch, cut, a severe wound, a scar, surgery. The scar heals, and it knows damn well when to stop growing, settle down, let that scar line heal, and disappear. You couldn't orchestrate it better. A cancer forgets all those principles. It forgets where to stop. It forgets to, to die if it forgets to remodel. So it abuses all of the normal processes of the cell and of the body. And one of the items that is most curious that we've, how could we have not known this before, which we've really found out in the last 15 years, is that cells eat glucose constantly. Now, the organ in your brain that eats glucose constantly, uh, the organ in your body that eats glucose constantly is your brain. And now we have a, have a tumor population where cells are constantly eating available glucose. The reason that people with chronic lymphocytic leukemia uh, have one famous symptom, which is sweating, is because they're always eating glucose. Glucose is a very inefficient way to use energy. And they have to get rid of the extra heat. They don't use fat. And many cells in the cancer world act like stem cells. They don't go through the normal process of differentiating and dying off, just like your skin. The earliest, youngest skin cells are proliferating. Then they mature. Then they get to the top of your skin. And then you wash them off every day. Uh, cancer stem cells are, act, are like cells sitting at the basal level, keeping growing. And, never, and forgetting to differentiate. Now, one of the key events to take from all of that is that really, there aren't 200 cancers. There are 200 million cancers. Because every cancer we've ever looked at is different from any other. So um, at this point, I, I like to say, you know, cancer is not hypertension. We're not going to have a treatment for cancer the way we do for hypertension or even for renal insufficiency. It's a whole different process. So now I'm going to take you briefly through a, a favorite characterization of this that scientists use called the hallmarks of cancer, um, uh, published and updated a few years ago, and helps us understand this a little bit more mechanistically. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but just to give you a sense that there is a unifying theme that tries to capture all the major elements uh, that make up cancer. So first is that cancer cells evade the things that, st that tell cells to stop growing. Part of that evasion is the immune system that will, uh, is our, always um, surveying us and looking for abnormalities and getting rid of abnormal cells. The second and third areas are allowing, as in the cancer stem cell, a concept, the growth without cessation. So you know, one of the first hallmarks of Helen Lane cells, who had ovarian cancer and formed the cell line called HeLa, was that scientists could put the cells in the laboratory, grow them in a simple Petri dish, and they kept growing and growing and growing. The number of cell divisions of that single population of cells today is in the probably millions of divisions that have taken place from that cell. So they, uh, cancer enables replication and reproduction uh, to immortality. And often, either tumors either um, have their own or are promoted by inflammation processes, which is why there is this concept that sites of inflammation give rise to cancer, which is probably mostly wrong. It may very well be just the opposite, that the tumor actually initiated the inflammation and the swelling. As I mentioned, uh, tumors can actively invade and metastasize. And in, if you think about what those processes are, um, I talked to a gentleman today who mentioned to me that his tumor had left the colon and gone into the lymph nodes. 
I talked to somebody else who said that it hadn't. So what's that exactly? So you have a tumor that's growing inside the, in the middle of your colon, and the colon has a mucosa, and it has muscle, and it has fibrous tissue, and just like your skin, which you can see, and it doesn't act up, those layers are inviolate until the tumor cell comes along and says, forget that, and starts going through all those barrier zones, and then somehow leaves that space and goes into a lymph node or goes through your blood. So the ability of these cells to stop performing in the regimented way of normalcy is such that it allows for them to spread uh, quite aggressively in a whole variety of different spaces uh, and formats. And they bring in their own blood vessel supply. So they pump out factors that encourage a blood vessel that may be an inch away to migrate and find its way uh, into the tumor to supply uh, blood uh, to that tumor. My own area of research is in genomic instability, which I think is probably the most important and still not well recognized enough. And that is, if you're going to have a tumor with 5,000 mutations, the genetic maintenance system must not be working. So often we think that that's where cancer starts, with the inability to control and observe uh, how these cells are working. Uh, and the last two are the deregulated cellular genetics. I think I said it in English. They eat glucose all the time. And we talked about how they uh, proliferate. So from what I've mentioned to you, scientists have taken those simple concepts or maybe the other way around, evading normal growth control, dying pathways, uh, eating glucose all the time, dividing uncontrollably, spreading where they shouldn't, um, and have, have turned this into the 10 major themes that scientists now spend their time on in trying to understand the origins and thus the treatment uh, of cancer. The HeLa cells are immortal, but that's what made them special. I, I'm not clear, are you saying that all cancer cells are immortal? No. Um, uh, uncontrolled growth, yes. And there is, you're absolutely correct, a space between uh, overgrowth and immortality. And uh, I'd have to argue that there is probably every variation on the theme along that path that can get you there. So I think you're correct. Um, uh, we're often in, in, the, in the lab struck by somebody who comes up with a, um, a cell line that's called, I'll give you, for instance, VACO 470. So that was VA, VACO. So VA, so Veterans Hospital Laboratory, CO, colon cancer, 470. We tried 470 times, and we finally got it to work once. So you're absolutely right. These are still rare occurrences, uh, but they're striking. You did bring up a point that I noticed when I was in school a few years ago, or many years ago. Uh, I got to examine a cancerous tumor and noticed it was one of the most highly vascularized pieces of tissue I've ever seen. Clearly, cancer secretes something that causes the blood vessels to grow towards it, and perhaps at an accelerated rate. Has anybody investigated this as a potential cure, or at least trying to disrupt or interfere with the cancer? This uh, gentleman, uh, Judah Folkman, who was a professor of mine in pediatrics at, at Harvard when I was an undergraduate, actually came up with the term of angiogenesis and cancer and studied for decades as a surgeon, observing the same thing you did, that there are too many blood vessels going into these cancers that seem to be both abnormally made, fragile, um, and drawn to the cancer inexorably. And he actually uh, began a series of experiments and created a whole field of anti-angiogenesis, anti-blood vessel therapy. And there are now a number of drugs on the market, an antibody uh, that stops blood vessel production, stops that hormone that would cause the blood vessels to come in, and a small molecule which stops the ability of the blood vessel to respond. So there are treatments now based on that work um, and it's really directed towards the normal body response using blood vessels. It doesn't treat the cancer at all. It's just really treating the blood vessels. None of those 
uh, I should be careful. Most of those have not resulted in cures. But in breast cancer, there's a subpopulation, about 30% of, of women, who can receive that treatment and have striking benefit. In other areas, it's been helpful in colon cancer. Uh, but it's not likely to be a cure in large part because it's not touching the genetic abnormality of the tumor. The profuse sweating, uh, if someone has that, if, is that a symptom, a possible symptom of leukemia? If they're sweating when eating but not otherwise? You know, it happens to be a clinical area of mine, so the one question I ask and trust is night sweats. So, uh, you know, we all sweat, it's hot and cold and all that, but if somebody tells me that, you know, for the last four months, three, f three nights out of five, I have to get up in the middle of the night and change my bed shirt, that's a problem. Other sweating is a little more subtle, but that one's pretty characteristic. The DNA repair mechanisms are part of cellular biology. What, what is undermining the natural DNA repair mechanisms? Well, we're about to talk about that. Uh, so if you'll let me, I will move in. Uh, let me just repeat the question and set us up for the next section. So the question is, what about what's wrong? What goes wrong with uh, with DNA repair? So um, I don't know what in the world DNA repair is, and you probably don't either. So let me try to explain. Okay. So uh, our cells, as I mentioned early on, uh, have DNA as the blueprint for what our cells look and act and, and do, uh, because the DNA is the genetic sequence that's inviolate in the cell, and all the cells it produces should be replicated exactly for each, each cell. Um, makes the RNA, which makes the protein. Your body's made up of the proteins. So it isn't so easy to make sure that every copy that's made of your genes of your DNA is exactly the same. So we have a machinery that'll copy it, but it makes mistakes. And so the copy machinery and repair process is one which is a proofreading process. So there's a genetic system of proofreading, a sequence which is just like proofreading a manuscript. And sometimes that system goes haywire. And if you were, you know, the, the cancer god, you'd want to screw that thing up first off, because then you're home free, because then you can wait for mutations to happen and take the best ones. And that concept, after all, I think is called Darwinian evolution. And as we'll hear and spend some time on next week, um, this idea that you can move from a very stable set of genes to mutated genes is rare in nature and, and, and in the environment, but common and uniform in cancer. So just as uh, uh, we've evolved by organism and by shades and beaks and the like, uh, every tumor takes advantage of that Darwinian evolution process to select the most resistant, the toughest, the most enabled uh, cancer cell. So what are these processes? I want to go into a little more detail. So I want to explain to you about cell cycle, cell proliferation, oxidative stress, DNA damage, immune surveillance, hormone balance, and stem cells. If we get through all that, I think you can graduate with a degree. So um, uh, a nice way to sort of bring home this this concept is, is the example of uh, uh, Mary Kay King, who, in fact, did her degree in evolutionary genetics. Um, and she was disappointed to find that all chimpanzees that she could look at were, were pretty close, but that was given the genetic capabilities that they had at the time. Um, and <clears throat> she became interested in uh, genes, environment, and other changes. And so in around 1990, so about 24 years ago, she made the discovery of a region on chromosome 17. It took her a while to figure out that it was one gene that was responsible for the multiple um, breast and ovarian cancers that occurred in families. And she called that uh, breast cancer gene 1, BRCA1, um, and took that 
uh, knowledge to then identify uh, BRCA2. And I was uh, lucky enough to hear the whole story from her about uh, four years ago when we both attended the uh, uh, Princess uh, Takamatsu Cancer Research uh, Conference um, that was actually on DNA repair and cell cycle um, in uh, Tokyo. And what she did was notice that this mutation, BRCA1 and 2, altered the ability of the cells to manage the accuracy of that proofreading function during the copying of the genes before uh, cell division. So it affected both the copying function and the cell division function. So I'll just remind you the simple concept of cell division. If you're going to go from one cell to two, you've got to copy everything first, segregate it out into two parts, squeeze them apart, and divide them. So in this case, we're most interested in the ability to copy the genes. So that's called DNA for the genes, replication, copy. And then mitosis is simply the process of pulling everything apart. And all of that's got to happen exactly correctly. So each cell has exactly the same material, unless you're favoring one cell over the other in a particular function. So the details of that have now been well worked out. There's a whole process that cells dance through with hundreds of proteins and genes that are critical and essential. And so you can imagine if you wanted to muck up the system, it wouldn't be very hard to take advantage of something that caused the cells to grow too fast, to slow down, maybe not copy their DNA and get it proofread by the time they divide it. So there's a whole variety of different ways that that simple, very beautiful system can get uh, messed up. And uh, when we get into the uh, cancer problem discussion specifically, we'll come back to this issue of the cell cycle. Now, I mentioned also about cells dying, that, that CLL cells forget to die. So you know, you've got to have li li living cells, and you've got to also figure out a way to program some cells to die off. And the easiest way to think about that, I'll give you two, <laughs> one in human and one not. Um, when we're in the embryo, we have webs between our fingers, and something's got to get rid of those webs. And so there's a programmed method to get rid of that web and have all those cells die off and leave us our fingers. And the other program cell death, of course, is leaves falling off trees at the end of the growing season. So that's a programmed process. It's not random. It's very well regulated. And so a, 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 a shift up or down in either of those processes can mess up the balance here. And if you think about the process of dividing and contracting, uh, you can realize that tumors can form pretty quickly if you imbalance the living and division part from the dying part. I mentioned briefly uh, DNA damage and repair. So uh, at one glance, you might think that all genes and all parts of your DNA are supposed to have a high degree of fidelity. And how could anything go wrong unless it was a mistake? But I'd like to point out to you that mistakes are important. You need to have mistakes um, in your DNA for a whole variety of reasons. You just want to control them. So the balance between the ability to make mistakes and fix them, or make mistakes and control them, and to grow uh, and divide after uh, copying that DNA is critical. And there are hundreds of genes involved with the simple thing of making sure your DNA is OK and allowing it to be copied. And many specific tumors are based specifically on abnormalities of those DNA damage and repair uh, processes. Now, one of the easiest to think about is a physiologic process of oxidative stress. So when we metabolize sugar, um, we make extra oxygen. And those are called reactive oxygen species. And we can receive excess doses of that, if you will, from UV light radiation, and the like. So our normal enzymatic and me metabolic processes can generate reactive oxygen species, as, as can ultraviolet light. And I recently <laughs> had an aha moment talking to a, a pediatric uh, cardiologist who was studying DNA repair due to this process in the heart 
at birth, reminding us that there's an incredible problem of oxidative stress that happens right at the time of birth when the oxygen level that the fetus is exposed to, now newborn, goes from something like 7 or 8 percent or maybe 5 percent to 21 percent. And so that sudden burst of oxygen becomes an incredible stress. Uh, we all lived through it, last time I checked. And the reason is we have incredibly regulated DNA repair processes that not only manage it, but actively, 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 proactively modulate the heart and any, every other organ in the body of the newborn to get it ready for real oxygen. And so valves open and close, blood pressures change, blood vessel sizes change, um, uh, muscles, uh, muscular cells contract. Uh, a whole variety of processes happen quite physiologically due to this process. So as you can see uh, here, oxidative stress is important for every organ uh, in the body. So there are tightly regulated processes in the body to make sure, and in the cells, to make sure that we can both encourage, manage, and respond to uh, these degrees of, of oxidative stress. Now, I study DNA damage and repair. So one of the consequences of this oxygen burst is oxygen showing up on molecules where it shouldn't be. One of those is the eight position of guanine in the DNA, giving rise to something which we technically call 8-oxoguanine. It's just oxygen sitting where it shouldn't in the DNA. And so now it's in vogue to look at oxidative damage by studying that particular molecule in people with Alzheimer's disease, in renal failure, a whole variety of things, and see if we can't uh, label oxidative damage as the cause of those disorders. I sort of doubt it, but it is important to be able to get rid of and manage that damage to the DNA. Now we've had those repair mechanisms all the way back to bacteria. In fact, every single component of the DNA process, repair, proofreading machinery was present in bacteria. And when I was a young assistant professor, <clears throat> I had a devil of the time trying to deal with those bacteria guys who always use the bacteria names and the human gene guys who always use the human gene names and not being able to figure out what was what. <laughs> and they were the same proteins. In fact, they have been so incredibly conserved that the differences in the sequence between the bacteria and the human is often in the tens to twenties of um, bases in a 1,000 base pair gene or a 20,000 base pair gene. So they're incredibly heavily reserved, uh, uh, conserved. So these are important, and yet they're the cause of cancer. Let's see if I can, am I frozen out here? Let's see if I can do this. There we go. Um, one other area in which um, a DNA repair is critical, is your immune system. So this shows a very simplified way in which you make those antibodies I was talking about a few, uh, a few minutes earlier. So the, the, the genome decided <laughs> that it couldn't have a gene for every one of those 5 million antibody proteins that you wanted to make to protect you against 5 million bacteria. So they said, no problem. We'll just invent this cut and paste and match system called VDJ rejoining. And I don't really understand it, but Neil could probably explain it to us. But it's a process in which three distinct small regions of the DNA have repetitive pieces in them that aren't exactly quite matched. And if you mix and match, mix, mix and match them together, you can come up with about 5 million different combinations. So how do you go from that sequence in the DNA to the antibody? You've got to cut and paste and rearrange it. So there's a DNA repair process which does all that rearranging in the, in the immune cells and allows you to make 5 million different types of B cells which make your antibodies. So here's just another example of the normal use of DNA damage and repair to help our immune system. It's also the cause of lymphomas. Because in fact, if we 
Can you see this up here? No. If we make a mistake in that rearrangement system, we can actually take that heavy chain portion, the red on the uh, upper left, and link it to another gene entirely far away that allows that to be overexpressed as to start growing or to be expressed in the cell, allowing the cells to be growing as if it was a lymphocyte that was reacting to something that it shouldn't be reacting to. So this can, in fact, be a cause of lymphomas. This rearrangement is a very delicate time in the life of a normal uh, lymphocyte. And uh, likewise, uh, hormones, which we all know we have, which are critical to every function of the body. And if you think about it, it's the way the body communicates across organelles. And it's, a, it's the way the brain talks to the gut, the way the gut um, might talk to bones. So you need hormones to go across large distances. And yet we know that they can be messed up and intervene in the growth signaling of cells. And so here's just an example of how the normal function of estrogen and progesterone, if improperly expressed on tumor cells, allows those cells to grow un, uh, unavoidably, uh, and how that can be blocked with tamoxifen, which I mentioned as an anti-estrogen that will bind to that site and prevent the estrogen from getting in. So the final concept uh, for the evening is about cancer stem cells. And we're actually having a conference uh, downtown uh, in August, I think on the 19th to the 21st, uh, an international conference uh, that we're sponsoring uh, to bring experts together to talk about this new area of research in cancer called cancer stem cells. So the easiest way to think about stem cells is the blood system. It turns out we have about 50,000 stem cells in our bone marrow that lasts us for 90 years. And every once in a while, one of those cells wakes up, starts dividing, and produces all of our blood cells. Every day, we make about 10 billion white cells. So that process, that engine, is incredibly uh, robust. And yet it comes from a very, very small number of stem cells, 50,000. And you don't get any more. So, the concept that we have resting cells in the body that are highly proliferative, that know how to evade all those bad things from happening to us over 90 years, is pretty powerful. And it's made a number of us think that there must be a similar cell called a cancer stem cell that's the source and origin of all these bad tumors that we have. Now, I personally sort of doubt it. But I think that's an important concept because it gives us an idea of the link again between the normal, which we've been talking about all evening, and the abnormal in the cancer space. So if cells in the, in the stem cell variety space start picking up some of those abnormalities we've been talking about, then you can imagine how they would take the stem cell phenotype and ability to grow, evade, et cetera, and use it um, in a bad way. So I think I've opened up the topic for you this evening of how defective evolutionary processes are found in cancer. I'll remind you that we talked about the cell cycle, the ability of cells to grow or to die, uh, proliferation, and how important managing that level of proliferation is and how its abuse uh, is a common um, finding in cancer cells, how oxidative stress can be used both in a protection normal way but also in a damaged way to the DNA. How DNA is so critical, or DNA repair is so critical to the maintenance of the normal genome and that we live by our genome. How immune surveillance uh, is critical to maintaining uh, normal versus abnormal uh, cells within the body. How hormone balance is also critical to these processes. And how stem cells uh, may in fact be important uh, in the uh, cancer uh, process. So I'm going to leave you a few things to think about. And if you don't ask enough questions, we may actually have to answer these, um, either now or, or later. But I have a couple of things for you to think about. And in fact, it relates to the question I was asked earlier this evening. How many cell divisions would it take to produce the number of cells in a 60-pound person? We've got some mathematicians in, in the audience. And I bet somebody can help us answer that question. Uh, 
I am curious about your thoughts about whether cancer is a common event or a rare event, whether it's inherited, which I haven't really focused on this evening. And why is it, if we've done so well with hypertension, cardiac disease, maybe even diabetes, why is the risk of dying from cancer declined only um, by 20% over the last uh, 20 years? We've spent a hell of a lot of money trying to understand um, cancer, and we just haven't gotten very far. So with that, I'd like to stop and take further questions. Thank you.